good to get the, the feedback to know that it's working. Uh, so here we go. Uh, I, so I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, it's a real honor for me to be the chairman of the advisory board for, uh, for Data Science Nigeria. It's, it's an awesome organization I've been following for several years. And I've, I think this is my, my third, I think, the boot camp where I've spoken. And so I'm really looking forward to today's talk. Uh, so you just got a great lesson in natural language processing. And I really love the discussion about how does it work? Uh, it, it, how do you do NLP? and things of like large language models when uh, the language is not known to the algorithm yet. And so that's a very, very important uh, problem to be solving. And so I'm gonna talk more generally today, even though I'm gonna have some natural language processing here, of course, because that's one of the big stories this year. Uh, but I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit generally about generative AI. Uh, but in fact, you're gonna see that my talk is actually gonna be even more general than that. So that's the, the idea is, to, is, to, is not to get you too many specific things, but, but very general things that can help you, not just, uh, just generally help you in your career, but maybe help you see something that you wanna um, try for yourself. Uh, so I'll mention quite a few different concepts and maybe one or two or more of those concepts will be interesting to you. So it's not just NLP, it's, there's, there's many other things in this talk. And so I'm gonna start off uh, again at this, uh, talking about this thing called emerging trends, okay? So, so emerging trends in generative AI and so what's now and what's next for AI. So how do we know about trends? Well, for one thing, people talk about it, you see it in the news. Uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion about it. Sometimes there's a lot of uh, too much discussion about some things. And, that, you know, of course, trends can go up, trends can go down. Uh, trends often identify something new and it's developing the next big thing. So so we, we can think about that in terms of the context of what we've seen in the last couple of years, uh, that uh, one of the, uh, the great trends in business, they people call digital transformation. And I think ideally we should call it digital disruption because it's really the disruption of, of business models and, and, and ways we do business, ways that we work, jobs that we apply for, uh, the, the way that you know, everybody works is changing. So there's, so there's transformation and disruption and two uh, sort, of, sort of major uh, changes in, or, or transformative forces in the last few years. One was the, uh, the COVID pandemic, which dra drastically transformed the way business was done. Uh, and now this uh, whole thing around chat GPT and generative AI, it's been in the, dis in the news, it's been in, there, in every discussion I've been in, you know, with even friends and neighbors who don't have any knowledge of these technologies. They're asking me about it, they want to know about it. And so people are talking about it, it's, ch it's changing the way people are thinking. Is it gonna take my job? Is it gonna change my job? Uh, the businesses are discussing, should we do it? How should we do it? Uh, we don't wanna be left behind. Uh, so it creates uh, what you would know, I guess you would call FOMO and say fear of missing out. A lot of organizations rush into doing things uh, when they see these trends because they, they fear they're going to miss out, that, that other companies are going to uh, start doing this and take away business. And so it's, 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 it's transforming in the way people think and what they do. So what does the actual data tell us about this? Okay, so yes, we can we can talk about uh, you know people's emotions. We can talk about you know the discussions we have with friends and neighbors. We can talk about things that we're reading in the news uh, and, and conferences we go to. I mean, it just I, for one thing, I do I do a lot of book reviews. I can't I, I can't even count the number of new books this year to talk about generative AI and Chat GPT. I mean, I, I've been wanting to write a book for many years, and I, I think it'll take me <laughs> years to write a book. I, I'm very impressed with people who can start with an idea like just this year, ChatGPT, and there's already many books already written that are available on this subject. And so what does historical data tell us about trends and especially technology trends? Well, uh, fortunately we have this thing called the, uh, the Gartner hype cycle. Okay, so Gartner is a company, uh, it's an analyst company that analyzes different technologies, what businesses are doing. And they've recognized this particular pattern. Okay, so this this trend, this pattern, uh, sort of seems to repeat itself, not just in technology trends, but even in life. You know, where, where you know even even our emotions. Sometimes we see something new and exciting, uh, and, and we get we get excited about it. That, uh, so we have this in innovation trigger. Okay, so look at the that little bottom box down there. So, so first, there's the the thing that's uh, that triggers. And a new innovation, new thinking, and then people expect it to go to you know to to great heights and to, to to change the world, to change your life, to change everything. That that's the peak of inflated expectations, and then it doesn't quite measure up to what you think it's going to do, and then people sort of get disillusioned with it. Okay, so they 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 think oh it's, it's not as it's not what I thought it was, 
and there's this sudden drop and and uh, you know in terms of people's interest in it or people's uh, expectations the promises the, the hopes the positive thinking sort of changes to more negative thinking about it so that's that trough of disillusionment but if it's a real useful technology it comes back up and people start realizing okay let's stop talking about being a you know fear of missing out let's not just rush into it because everyone else is doing it therefore i should do it let's 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 take a step back think about it in terms of our business model in terms of our career model in terms of what we need to accomplish what are our goals and how is this going to help us achieve our goals then we start getting this enlightenment the slope of enlightenment starts yeah i can see how this is going to help me i can see how this is going to help my life my business you know my world you know what i what i have to do it and then we get into this final phase of what they call the plateau of productivity where you know we're no longer just like talking about it we're actually uh, producing something from it and so this this is what data shows uh, and Gartner has analyzed many, 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 many different technologies and many different types of organizations, and this pattern repeats itself over and over again. And, and this, and this is specifically the hype cycle for artificial intelligence for this year. In fact, this article was just published last month. So this was uh, July of this year, just last month. So specifically, what about generative AI? Okay. Well, what about it? Well, if you looked closely, and I, and if you didn't see it, I'm, I'm going to point it out right now. Uh, what do you see at the very peak of this hype cycle? Okay, the very peak of hype, the very peak of inflated expectations, generative AI right there. So we're right at the part place where we we probably should be a little scared. Okay, like uh, people, there's too much, there's too much hype about it. You know, people talk about it's going to change the world, it's going to solve world hunger, it's going to end poverty, it's going to cure cancer. You know, it's going to solve all of our problems, and and you know maybe it will, but but I think we just keep talking like that. Uh, that people are going to get disillusioned and again they're going to uh, stop believing you and stop listening uh, because you, if you say too many times that hey this you know this new technology you know it, it was AI for a while there it was machine learning it, it's blockchain it's quantum computing I mean we, we keep saying all these different things are going to change the world and, and and they are they're going to but but we, we can't say it's going to be the one and only thing and so so we need to be careful when we're at this peak of the cycle here because uh, we're going because you know what's going to happen uh, people are going to stop being interested so many companies are making big investments in generative ai and probably in the next year or so they're going to discover that those investments are not working they're not making money on their investments they, they probably rush too much money into it without thinking carefully about how does it fit into our business model what are our business goals i always tell people you got to think about what what are you in business for what is your business what is your goal Start with that, uh, what they call the North Star. What you know, what is it that you're aiming to achieve? Are you trying? Are you trying to solve a world hunger problem? Are you trying to solve a, a particular customer use case? Are you trying to solve the, a supply chain problem? Are you trying to improve customer engagement? Think about what is it that you exist for as a business or as a person working in that business, and don't just rush to something because everyone else is rushing there. So we have to expect a little disillusionment in the coming months and years. Uh, but we're going to get to this place where we're going to get some, some improvement in our, our, our way of thinking about this and actually get into that enlightenment and productivity phase. So that this is what, you know, data, lots of data, Gartner has analyzed millions of businesses and, and technologies, not millions, but certainly thousands. And this is uh, repeats itself over and over again. So what we have here is this something that's called the shiny object syndrome. And so this is a little cartoon uh, from a guy um, uh, Tom Fishburne, uh, he's uh, called the Marketunist. Uh, so he, I like his cartoons because they're very, he's, he's really uh, spot on in terms of how he sees business through the lens of humor, uh, but at what's happening in the world. Okay, so uh, so we know a little bit maybe about our dogs. They love to, to chase the squirrels and the small animals. And so in this, uh, so this is a business of dogs and they're, and they're trying to discuss their business. And they say, hey, we need to stay focused on our marketing priorities and not get distracted by every shiny new Oh, hey, look, there's a squirrel. So all of a sudden they're distracted. They're distracted from what they're discussing. They're just talking about their business focus, their business priorities. And all of a sudden they're distracted by the thing that, that's over there and, uh, out the window. Okay, so so this is called the shiny object syndrome. And, it, and it's called that because it, it happens to, uh, in most businesses. It happens to most of us. We get distracted you know, by the new thing. Okay. Oh, that new thing. Oh, I want one of those. I want that. I want to do that. And so we have to get, uh, uh, avoid uh, this uh, syndrome. Yes, we can pay attention to that thing. After all, everyone else is paying attention, We should, but we should pay attention to it within the context of that discussion of our business focus and our business priorities, not distract us from those focus and priorities. Okay. So this is, this is where uh, chat GPT and generative AI are this year. This is, it's this year's new shiny object. 
And so what happens when, when, you, when you got the new shiny object is you get lots of hype. Okay, that's why it's at the peak of the hype cycle. There is lots of hype. Okay, so I just saw this article on uh, our a Twitter thread on, on Twitter just last week. Okay, I guess it's not called Twitter anymore. It's called X. Okay, the, the X platform. Uh, it said 30 chat GPT prompts to make you $1 million. Oh, boy. And there's a beautiful graphic that they created to, to go with it. Okay, so that graphic was probably created by a generative AI algorithm. And, of course, I added this little caution warning to you that, okay, but yes, that would be wonderful if I could just use the, these 30 prompts and make a million dollars. But, uh, you know, we got to be careful. <laughs> so beware of the hype but at the same time you know we we can love this new technology we can use it and i'm going to show you a couple of examples where i used it uh and so these are just a couple of examples of chat gpt cheat sheets okay so so how do you pose a quite how do you pose a good query how do you how do you give a good question okay so okay so uh, so let's for say for example show me a lesson plan from the point of view of a teacher of mathematics of how would I teach students about calculus? And so ChatGPT can create a lesson plan, or I can say create an exercise for students who are in middle school or high school uh, about, uh, for example, a particular AI topic. So you can ask ChatGPT that. So you give it context, uh, you, say, you say what your role is, I'm a teacher or I'm a student or I'm a business leader or whatever. You can, so you, you put these different types of, of pieces into the query. Your, who you are, who, wh what is your context, what's the question, what, what is it you want? You want a story? Do you want an outline? Do you want a single answer? Do you want a paragraph? Do you want a book? Okay, so these cheat sheets help you be able to do that. So they are very useful in these large language models. Uh, the large language models have been very successful, which is why there is all this hype. And so I decided I'd try it for myself. So I opened this account on chat.openii.com. And I, and, I, and I did a couple of uh, uh, articles, a couple of blogs of, about my results. Okay, so one of the articles was I asked it to write a short story. Okay, so I just made up a title. I said, Time is a Wasteland. Okay, so I asked uh, ChatGPT to write me a short story where that is the title. Okay, I, I gave it no other information. I said, Just write a short story where the title of the story is Time is a Wasteland. Okay, and it did a pretty interesting job. And then I went to uh, uh, Stable Diffusion, which is a website that generates images from prompts and I asked it to create an image for my article. I said, create an image that I can use with my article called Time is a Wasteland. That's all I said. I said, I didn't, I didn't show it the story. I just said the title of the story is Time is a Wasteland and I want an image to go with my story. Well, it actually gave me four choices and I used two of those choices in my story. So if you, if, so when, at the end of this talk, you'll see a link to these slides. Okay, so if I run out of time, because I have a lot of slides here, uh, you, will, you will get a link uh, to these slides and you can download and, and click on these links and, and follow this. Okay, so the second article I wrote was, I, was, it was actually the first one I did with ChatGPT. I, I, I just gave it some queries and these are the, these are the seven queries. Actually, there was eight, uh, but I just gave you these seven right here. The eighth one was, some, it was a little test. I asked it some financial advice and of course it gave me the right answer. It says, I'm not programmed to give you financial advice. <laughs> okay, so uh, that, but that was good. It gave me the right answer. It says, it's not gonna tell me how to invest my money. Is that this is, you know, the ChatGPT was smart enough. They trained it well to say, no, I'm not gonna give you financial advice. That's, you know, that's a personal decision. So, but, the, but I asked it these questions and you can see what they, what ChatGPT said. So I, so I, so I, it, I posted these things and then I, I found it interesting and I think we should all find, we all should all experiment and see what it does. And I mean, don't run away from it. When I say it's hype, that doesn't mean run away from it. It just means cautious and how you use it and how much expectation you have right now. So what does this lead me to? Okay. So, so I want to lead, I want to talk a little bit about career now. Okay. So what am I talking about here? <laughs> okay. This is, this is, this is at a point in your career where, wow, this is the most exciting thing. I want to do this the rest of my life. And, may, and maybe it is, and maybe you will. Uh, but, 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 but there's a lot, there's a lot that you need uh, to build a career. And I always tell people a career is a long time, right? A career is not just, you know, one year or one month it's, or, or even five years or 10 years. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at near the end of my career, actually. And so, in fact, some of those things that were in, in my bio that you heard at the beginning, uh, some of those things have changed. OK, so I, I've actually retired from, from that company that was mentioned and uh, I'm, I'm more working for myself now. OK, so but but so, so careers are very long things at the time. And what you need in a, in a successful career is a firm foundation, you know, something that you can always depend on. OK, so it, it, I, I like to use this little physics example. Of course, my background is astrophysics and physics, so I so I like to use physics examples. OK, so there's an example of a stable equilibrium 
where, where something is balanced and always can, can, can be stable. And then there's the example of an unstable equilibrium where it's, t it's top heavy, there's, you know, it, has, it falls over. If you, you just push it a little bit and it falls over. And we want our, our learning to be uh, of, have a firm foundation that we can build on it throughout the career. We can keep building and building. Okay, you don't wanna build a building that's very narrow at the bottom and then it's very uh, wide at the top because it's very unstable. So, so you want your knowledge base to have a good foundation uh, that, and that will last you an entire lifetime. So the things I learned in physics and math and astronomy 50 years ago, yeah, that was 50 years ago I was in school. Uh, I'm still using the basic concepts that I learned way back then. I mean, obviously the, the things we're doing are completely different. The programming languages we're using are completely different. The applications are completely different. I mean, things are just completely different, but the firm foundations of the mathematics and the modeling concepts and the way of thinking, critical thinking, curiosity, uh, the sort of the basic things you want to, I always fall back on those things. Okay, so it's, it's like a stable equilibrium for me. I can always rely on those problem solving skills and critical thinking skills that I was taught in school all those years ago. And so in some sense, this is, uh, one of the useful things of this uh, hype curve, instead of just scaring us, it can also give us some hope because we can look out there at the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity, and we see some things that can help us, okay? Knowledge graphs, cloud AI services, data labeling and annotation. You, you heard a lot about data labeling and annotation in the, in the previous talk, right? And then with these unseen, previously unseen languages for the large language models, you need to do labeling and annotation in order to train the models with unseen languages, okay? So these, these technologies are helping pull things forward, pull things into the plateau of productivity. And this, this is what is gonna help generative AI and chat GPT also be successful for the long term. We may, you know, maybe not in the next year, because I think we are going to see some downturn in, in that slope there from the top, from the peak to, into the dissolution phase. But we know that we can, there's hope at the end. There's, and there's existing technologies out there that can help you know, make that successful. So let's look forward to that. So today, uh, I'm, I'm going to rush through a bunch of things. I, I actually put together a slide deck here. Uh, which, you, which again, you'll have access to these slides when I'm done, which is actually for a, a slightly longer uh, mini course that I was preparing on chat GPT and generative AI. So I decided I would leave all the stuff in here, even though some of it might be too much for today and, and, remind, and certainly not enough time for today. Uh, but I didn't want to take it out. I wanted to leave it here so you can have access to it. Even if I don't have a chance to go through it, uh, you'll have access to it. You'll have access to the content here, uh, even if time prevents me from actually say, saying all the things that are in this small course here. So, the, so, the, so there's basically seven topics, and some of them are short and some of them are long. Um, and so, don't, so, so I think one of the first ones is kind of long. So they're, not, they're not all that long, <laughs> but uh, it's, they're different lengths. But these are sort of, the, sort of the seven things, which I think help contribute to those foundations and basics uh, that I was talking about. Okay, so we're not going to get all too too much into uh, the, the, the details of large language models and, and so forth, but we're sort of going to understand sort of what makes them possible. And so, so what is it that we're going to talk about? Okay, we're going to talk about the, the foundations and basics. And the first question is why? Okay, so I already gave you some why because it's a career thing. Uh, then we're going to talk about AI and data literacies, uh, vectors and vector embeddings, conditional probabilities, which we find in Bayesian and Markov modeling, uh, graphs and knowledge graphs, and then some applications which are which are expanding in the universe around us, expanding in the world around us, uh, virtual realities, including metaverse, and this explosion of data sensors throughout the world, and Internet of Things and the industrial Internet of Things, IoT and IIoT. Uh, these are applications that are going to be enormous in the coming decade, in the coming years. Uh, if you want to actually focus on something specific in terms of an application area in, in your career, uh, these are places where there's going to be a tremendous amount of business opportunity, uh, innovation opportunity, uh, opportunity to, to, to use and apply the, the things you're learning in this boot camp. And then we're going to just talk about sort of what, what there's the, I think the, the, the benefit of all these things is the productivity it creates, okay, it creates productivity in individual people and in groups and teams and also in full businesses, okay, so so, so when I think about what's the goal, what's the focus of these LLMs and uh, ChatGPT and generative AI, it's the productivity enhancement. I mean, that's the exciting part. It's the exciting part is that it accelerates and enhances productivity. It's not that I have some cool new shiny thing to play with. I don't want that shiny object syndrome, but I want to see how that shiny object increases things that matter to my business and to my organization and to uh, people around me. And that's that productivity enhancement. I mean, do, do, doing better, doing more, uh, doing, 
you know, good things and uh, more good things and better good things. Okay, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that at the end. Okay, so again, some, some of these will be short, some, some will be a little bit longer. We'll see how we go. Okay, so the first topic is why are the foundations the most important? Well, I'm going to give you an answer which might surprise you. Why are the foundations most important? It's a quote from a famous guy called Albert Einstein. And he said, compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. Well, he didn't exactly say that. And I'll show you in a minute what exactly is it. And so you might say to yourself, what, why are we talking about compound interest now? But that's a sudden change of subject, isn't it? <laughs> well, no, not really. Uh, why? Because uh, I, I, I wrote a blog, another blog article on my uh, sort of about things that I learned in my career. And one of the graphics I used, which is on the left there, was in my early days of my career, I just felt like I wasn't really like moving along very rapidly. I felt in the early days that I, okay, I, I went to all those years of school. I had all those years of college and, and graduate school. And after 21 years of education, I got my first job and I was like, I was, I was, it was a terribly <laughs> low paying job. And I said, is that, what, was it worth it? Was it worth 21 years of education, getting a PhD? And I'm an instructor at a university and the, <laughs> my salary was pretty bad. <laughs> And, then, and and there was a lot of things at the beginning where I just felt like I was making very small steps and didn't seem like I was going so anywhere. But those small steps built up over time into a very large uh, change, you know, and very, very large advancement. And in my own career, I felt uh, looking back on it, I said, wow, if, if I didn't make those small steps, if this, if this, I look at some little thing I did, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and I, and I, I wondered why I was doing that, even though, you know, my boss asked me to do it, so I did it, but I just wondered... And in hindsight, I said, if I didn't do that, I would not be where I am today. So, so you never know what small steps are going to lead you up uh, to that great change in your and great advancement in your career. And so where does compound interest come in? Well, there's this little formula here uh, that uh, so, so compound interest is basically if something is in percent interest, then uh, then one plus N, N is a percent, let's say 1%, so 1.01. If you improve that much every day, you improve 1% every single day. How much do you improve after one year? Okay, if, you, if something improves 1% every day after 365 days, does that mean it's 365% better? Which is 365% would be 3.65. Okay, 3.7, let's say. 3.7 times better after one year. Well, no, because compound interest means 1 plus N percent times one plus n percent times one plus n percent that's one plus n percent to the 30 365th power so it's actually more than 37 times improvement instead of three and a half 3.6 or 3.7 so why am i saying this it, it's 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 those small steps it's those small increments of learning okay so maybe today you're not gonna be uh, this week you're not gonna learn everything you want to learn about ai or everything you want to learn about natural language processing or computer vision or autonomous vehicles or, or what is it that you're focused on this week? But you can build on that. You can do, you can learn a little bit every day. You can improve every day. Well, maybe not 1% every day, because if you improve 37 times in one year, that's 1,000 times in two years. That's 37,000 times in three years. Well, yeah, that's all the books of the world after a while. So, so I don't think anyone wants to read that much. But the, the point is invest in your learning wealth, okay? So, it's not, so you think of compound interest in terms of financial matters but think about learning wealth do, do that those habits of lifelong learning where you learn a little bit and you keep learning a little bit and then you'll seemingly small steps over time you'll see the, the really big change and and the foundations that you build on again the foundations that i'm talking about you know so maybe learn some calculus maybe learn some linear algebra if you don't already know it but if you do know it you know make sure you, you have a good solid understanding of it because I, there's, there's places where i i found linear algebra Throughout my career, when I took that course in college, I said, "Why am I taking this? It's interesting. I like math. You know, I loved the course because I love math. But I said, but I, but I really had the question. I mean, this is sort of very theoretical stuff. I didn't understand why necessarily I needed to learn learn about tensors and matrices, you know, and vectors and all this stuff. And well, it's like everywhere in the world now. So it's like uh, it was like probably the most useful math course I had, in, besides calculus. But I didn't realize it at the time. So, so make those little investments in lifelong learning. You know, invest in your learning wealth, and that and that compound interest formula can really help you. And and what Einstein really said was not that it's the most powerful force in the universe, though he could have, but I think what he actually said was compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And if you're not familiar with that, I mean, back in the old time, they talked about the seven wonders of the world, which are these these great things that uh, in the, in sort of in the, you know in Egypt and Mesopotamia and, and and Babylon parts of the world where they had these incredible like the pyramids and, and the hanging hanging gardens of Babylon, 
uh, the, these incredible towers and, and structures. And so we're in history, people talked about the seven wonders of the world, these incredible structures that humans built maybe 5,000, 6,000 years ago. And so he's, so that was sort of a, just, uh, just a concept, the seven wonders of the world. And so Einstein comes along and said, well, maybe it's compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. All right, so let's talk about AI literacy and data literacy for a few minutes here, because again, firm foundations, okay, Be being able to understand this. And so when we come right down to it, so I think a lot of people just uh, think, you know, generative AI is just some kind of magic box, you can, but it's not a magic box. It devours data, okay? Large language models are called large language models because they consume large amounts of language, large amounts of text. They learn, the, you know, they learn the patterns in the words. They learn what is the next best word in a sequence based upon these large corpora, these large databases, these large collections of language. Okay, so, so AI, no matter whether it's language AI or vision AI or whatever it is, it devours data. And that's a fundamental thing that has to be known at all times. So this, a lot of businesses said, hey, we want to apply chat GPT to our business and say, well, what kind of, what kind of, what kind of document repositories do you have that we can train it on? And so we don't really have a, a central depository. We just have, you know, you know, people just share emails with documents. And, it's, and, that, and that's not that non-centralized form of, of, of document handling. Maybe not a good idea for other reasons in a business, but at the same time, it's not going to it's not going to help you apply chat GPT or these models uh, to your internal business. If that's if that's how you maintain your, your data. Okay, and in a very uh, disparate, uh, unorganized, ungoverned way. And so understanding that it's the devouring data, all kinds of data is listed on this chart here. And that, that's really the, the fundamental building block of AI is that fuel. The fuel for it is data, just like real intelligence, real human intelligence, right? What is our data? Well, our data comes through what we see, what we taste, what we hear, what we touch. I mean, even small children, very small children learn by see, hear, touch. So our senses are data collectors, right? Our senses as a human being are data collectors and those data collectors learn, you know, not to touch something that's gonna burn our hand, not to play in a place where there's danger like in front of a car, <laughs> okay? So uh, we, we learn from experience, we learn from data, okay? And that's what AI exactly does, okay? So AI is an artificial intelligence. But I like to say there's nothing artificial about it. So that's another important lesson in, in AI and a fundamental fact of AI that people should pay attention to is we love to call it artificial intelligence. Well, first of all, it's, it may be it's not really an intelligence. It's just it's just parroting. It's just mimicking. It's just repeating what it's learned from from the patterns in the in the data that it's seen already. OK, so it's just some people call it just a statistical parrot. It just repeats back what it heard, what it sees. Okay, so, but but the outcomes that it produces are not artificial, okay? They're, excel I, I like to call these the seven A's of AI. And then there's an eighth one there called awesome intelligence. A friend of mine said, hey, just put awesome there. So I, I but the, it's accelerated intelligence. It's actionable. It's assisted, it's augmented intelligence. It's adaptable, amplified, and automated intelligence. These are the productivity enhancers. The, these are the real values of AI. It's nothing artificial about it. So what, what we're doing is taking a data to insights. Uh, that is, what do we see that's interesting or useful or, or helpful in the data? And then, and then we decide to take an action. And, and hopefully we choose the action that leads to some kind of business value, some kind of personal value, some kind of useful outcome. Okay, not just any action, but but we choose the optimal outcome that can produce you know the value that we're trying to do achieve. Okay, so so this is what AI is doing for us. It's it's taking data to insights to action to value, and, and there's sort of three broad categories. And I think you know uh, basically this already, but I, I think it's useful to think about uh, when people say, "Well, what does AI do?" Well, there's a thousand things AI can do. I mean, there's entire, entire books written about AI applications, entire courses. But for me, it's three broad categories, and I like to think about AI in these three categories. So there's image understanding, language understanding, and context understanding. And so these are sort of the kinds of things that help us as human beings navigate our world, what we see, what we hear. And, and not only what we see, what we hear, but what is the context in which we are seeing it or hearing it? What is the context? If someone is screaming out loud, maybe they're screaming because they just had a very happy experience, or maybe they're screaming because they just had an accident and injured themselves. So understanding the context of, of something, of, of a sound, of a noise, of a piece of data is extremely important in order to know what the next best decision is or the next best action in response to what the data is showing you. Okay, so you can understand what's in the imaging and you can understand what's in the language, but you also need to understand the context in which it's happening. 
So contextual intelligence is absolutely key. And I think that's uh, where AI is getting better. Uh, we've certainly, AI has been doing very good. And, and certainly this year we've seen it. And for years, we've been seeing how good AI is in terms of image understanding and language understanding. Uh, but in order to, to really make best decisions and best actions, we need to add this context feature. Okay, so some examples here of image understanding. So I don't need to spend time with this, but you know, sort of basically we going to understand and tag what's in images and not just images, but in videos, you know, any, any kind of things like that. Uh, also facial recognition, uh, face biometrics. Uh, for example, I, I use my face and probably you do too. My face unlocks my smartphone, right? When I, when I turn on my phone, it recognizes my face. And so it, I don't have to type in the code because it recognizes me. Okay, so that's, that's an, that, that's, that saves me a few uh, steps during the day. I just turn on my phone, it recognizes my face and I'm ready to go. Okay, so Im image understanding is helpful in many places. Language understanding, that's what we're talking about today. So there's many examples of that. Uh, that's a, you know, I talk about this forever, but certainly large language models, chat GPT, question answering, topic modeling, summarization, summarization and tagging of documents, even extraction of entities from documents. How do you find a persons, places, things, even numbers? find numbers and documents and what are those numbers? What is the context of those? Is, 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 it, is it a currency? Is it a, is it a, is a, is it a sports score? Uh, is it a survey? It, you know, what is it? What is it? What is, what is the meaning of the number there? Okay, so you can extract numbers from documents and, and entities, you know, persons, places, and things, and so forth. So a lot of uh, powerful things are taking place in language understanding. And then context understanding is where we're moving into and more, more so. And certainly it helps with large language models to attach themselves to knowledge graphs. And we're going to talk about that a little bit at the end here when we get to near the end. It's the knowledge graphs, uh, which basically connect all the different dots, the entities and relationships. So a knowledge graph can be basically a business model you know, about your, your product graph or your customer graph or your process graph. That, that what things relate to other things and how do they relate to one another? Okay, so that sort of knowledge graphs express the semantic relationships in your domain. And then if you, if, you, if you build a language model and then you can connect the language model back to those concepts and those, those contexts and those relationships, then you can see not just what the words are, what the words mean, but the context in which those words have meaning. And so you can, again, use the large language model for better decision-making, better action-taking. Okay, so what is context? Well, in, 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 some, in some way, you could just say it's just metadata. It's just other data about your data. Okay, so other data that can occur at the same time as, the, as what you're observing. Uh, it's other data that can occur at the same location. Okay, so we have geospatial data. And I guess you're going to hear about geospatial data tomorrow, I believe. A whole uh, segment tomorrow on geospatial AI. That's really a fantastic subject. Uh, my 20 years at, last, at NASA, I spent a lot of time working on geospatial understanding, geospatial intelligence. Location intelligence, it's, it's phenomenally useful in business and marketing uh, and supply chain and, and uh, you know, healthcare and medical treatments and so on. Okay, so it's other data about your data. Okay, so that's what context is. Uh, Hi, Joseph. Is there a question? Yeah, um, there's also a quick announcement you need to make um, quickly and then you continue your session. So um, for those of us, basically at the center, there is a uh, very cool Toyota uh, LRS 281JA, unit number LRS 281JA. Um, you are parked in front of an apartment and you're blocking uh, the owner. So please, if this is your number, you can please go check that. Thank you. Doctor, you can go ahead now. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry, I misunderstood what you're saying there. You, you want me to stop? I didn't hear for sure. Oh, okay. um, we just made a quick announcement um, and we are done. So you can go ahead with the session, sir. I'm still not sure you're saying, should I finish or not finish? I, I, I'm not, not sure what you're saying. Okay. Um, so we made a quick announcement to those who are physically here at the hall. Okay. Yeah. So, so that so announcement, I, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I, I was, a little bit of echo, so I wasn't sure what you were saying there. Okay, so we, so we just talked about those three general categories of AI, and I think generative AI is, is useful in the sense that it does a combination of these things. Okay, so you can actually use language uh, like, like I did. I created an image using stable diffusion for my short story. Okay, so I use text to ask this, this application, Stable Diffusion, to create an image, okay? So it understands, so certainly language understanding. So you can go to ChatGPT, the app, and ask it questions, like, we, like you can ask it to, you know, to create 
stories or, or explain things to you or create plans for you. And so we have this, we, we have this combination of image understanding, language understanding and context understanding. Okay, so we can go text to image or even image to text, or we can go text to data. That's, that's what I see people using ChatGPT to create synthetic data. So if you're training a model, a machine learning model, and you don't have the a sufficient amount of data, you can ask the chat GPT to create a data set, which you have to explain what you want in the data set in the context of the data set. Of course, you've got to give some very specific explanation of what you want, but it can create a synthetic data set that you can use. So text to data, but, but, but conversely, data to text. And this is one of the things I'm going to have right at the end of my talk here is the value of, of extracting stories and narratives and reports from data. Okay. So, t so you can, you can have, say, you know, tell me what's interesting in this data set. You know, to, to describe to me the anomalies or the trends in this data set. So you can ask ChatGPT to, to create a story or create a narrative or create a report, even create visuals, create a graph, a visualization. And there's, I'm going to show you an example at the end. I create visualizations for, of data just by asking it, by asking ChatGPT to do that for you. Okay, so we're, so we're combining this context understanding of language understanding, image understanding in very interesting ways. Uh, and, and of course, how do we do that? Well, we do that primarily in the, in the, in the, in the current world uh, through this thing called prompt engineering. Okay, so being able to ask good questions, well-formed prompts, well-formed queries, just like SQL. If you, don't, if you don't give SQL a good query, if you ask it to select something, for example, list all the, list all the you know, uh, the names of, of, of possible children, <laughs> if I, I want to name my child, uh, if you don't tell it select unique, then maybe the most common name, which maybe in our maybe in our country, maybe that name is John. Okay, so the name, if you don't say select unique, you'll get a million rows of John. Okay, or a million rows of Mary. I mean, it's like you, you select if, unique. Okay, so so you know how to behave properly, so to speak, in SQL world, asking good, well-formed queries, so you don't get the wrong or, or over too much answer, the wrong answer, whatever. Same thing with prompt engineering. We learn, and then that's what the value going to that little website that I, I showed you earlier, chat GPT, uh, oh, at .openai.com, is you can experiment and, 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 and use some of those chat GPT cheat sheets and learn how to do good queries and good prompts. I'm not, okay, so again, with, with this hype cycle, I'm not saying avoid this. I'm just saying be cautious in your expectations with it, but definitely you should learn it and do it. Okay, so a simple lesson in data literacy. Okay, this is going to go, this is a lot of slides, but I'm going to slip through this pretty fast here because I want to get finished uh, with, the, with the time we have remaining here. So, so the important thing about data literacy is, is that it's for all. I mean, every, every data is for AI, but data literacy is a life skill for everyone. It's not just a math skill. Everybody in the world encounters data, okay, whether it's just even just like, you know, selling goods on the street. Uh, you need to know how much you have, how, you know, how much money you're, you're making, how much you should charge, you know, what's your supply, uh, you, know, you know, what's in your inventory, when do you need to order more supply. So even if you're a small business, it's all about data. If you're a big business, it's definitely all about data, and, and it's a life skill. Okay, so, so as data science professionals and AI professionals, you need more than just data literacy, you need data fluency. So I like to use this little sign here as, a, as an example. Because uh, I say data literacy, uh, in, in some sense, is a way of thinking about numbers and measurement of things. Okay, let's say that again. Data literacy is a way of thinking about numbers and measurements of things. So this sign is a sign for a small town in South America, and and uh, I believe it was uh, intended to be a joke. Okay, I mean population, the number of people. It's feet above sea level, okay, so it's not meters, but feet here, uh, and, the, and the year that this town was established. And then somebody added these three numbers, okay, and that was sort of the joke, right, because it doesn't make any sense to add those three numbers. They're three completely different things, right? I mean, it's like if you say I have five children and I bought five gallons of milk, so I have ten things. Well, it was, that's sort of a strange thing to add number of children and gallons of milk. I mean, it's liters of milk. Okay, so 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 this it was sort of a joke, but 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 on the other hand, I, I use this as a, as a way of data literacy that, that there's actually what I said at least seven not so simple concepts in data fluency just from this single little sign, which was intended to be a joke. And so I'm, I'm, I actually give entire lectures on this. I don't have time for that today, so I will go through this very quickly here. 
but but the very first thing is to realize that everything is data. Okay, so so everything is data. That means those numbers are meaningful. They tell you something. They tell you the size of the city, the population. You know uh, what's the, what's its elevation above sea level? Is is it high? Is it low? Is is it in a mountain range? Is it in a valley? Is it is it you know is it rainy or is it not rainy? Is it hot? Uh, and the year established, how old is this town? Is it a new town, young town, or is, it, or is it an old town? So those numbers tell you something, okay? So it's all about data, okay? So so that's the first thing. That, that's the first concept is just recognizing data when you see it, just recognizing and being aware of data in your world. And then data profiling, which is what we just did, that is what I call having your that first date with your data. It's like having a date with your data. Okay, ask it questions. So what, what are these numbers? What are these numbers telling me? What are they about? Well, we just did that. Okay, then there's feature engineering. Okay, that's a, that's the next step. So these three numbers actually describe aspects of this town, but they're, they're descriptors. Well, there's many other types of descriptors we can choose, and I list a few of them there. You know, besides that, there's some of the other words you see there, in, like education or housing, or industry types or birth rate or death rate. In fact, you know, key industries, list of educational institutions, uh, social media information about this town, news articles about this town, popular attractions. There's other ways you can describe this town. Okay, so we so we build a feature vector which describes the town. So the feature vector is the list of features we use to describe the town. And then we want to do some kind of computation on that. If we want to do some machine learning or some classification, for example, maybe we want to find other towns like this one or, or classify this town into a certain category. Is this a good town for me to build my new uh, you know, a sports complex or this is a great town for me to build up this new uh, retail type of store? Uh, okay, so so I want to do uh, engineer. I want to do computing on data. So I, I do additional feature engineering, not just select the features, but maybe I combine them in certain ways. For example, let's let's say for example, in a, in a let's say a customer database, just for example, in my customer database, I have customer date of birth, I have the item that they purchased and the cost of the item. Well, just from those three things, I can extract many different engineering features depending upon my use case. I mean, for example, what's the customer's age? What is the project product category? And maybe I'll put a, a, a numerical code on the product category so I can do computation on product category. Maybe I look at the total number of purchases this year or this month. How many of those were book purchases? Total, total number of, of book purchases, total amount of money spent on all purchases, fraction of money spent on books. So I just, just from three items in, in, the, in the feature vector, I actually can create many different engineering features depending upon my use case. Okay, so, so, so again, we take that sign there and we can start doing computation on it. So maybe the, maybe the year the town was established is not a good number, 1951. They say, well, that town was established 62 years ago. Okay, so now I have computable data. So now I know it's not the absolute value of the year that's important, but it's the number of years since it was established. So this year town is 62 years old. Some other town is 162 years old. Some other town is you know 5,000 years old. So, so those, that's more computable. But now since we have different units, population, number of people, meters or feet above sea level, right there, what units are using? Feet, meters, miles, kilometers, and the year established or age. So we, so we do data normalization. We put everything on equal footing. And, and sometimes data normalization is you just take each feature and you normalize it to a zero to one scale. Okay, the minimum value, whatever the range is for that variable, whatever the variable is, the minimum value is zero, the maximum value is one. So you normalize data. So now all the different features, even though they're different units initially, they're now normalized zero to one. So you can do all kinds of things, distance and similarity measurements, find similar towns, find similar towns, you know, you know, find towns that are, that are most like this or are the most different from this. And then you can start doing you know, different kinds of things like class with a similarity and, and distance metrics, you can start applying um, different algorithms, K nearest neighbors for classification or K means clustering. Then you can evaluate those things and, and see how you can improve the, the clustering. For example, I want to find the number of different groups of, of different types of towns in this country. I want to find other towns like this one because I really liked when I visited this town. I want to find other towns that are like this one. So we can do this clustering analysis, this classification analysis and, 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 and sharpen it by improving the value of the number of clusters and, and then, or the number of uh, ways that we classify it. So, so we basically learned seven concepts from a sign that was initially looked like a, a, a joke uh, to, to actually building an enormous amount of data literacy. And like I said, I've given a whole lectures on this topic. And one of the things that appears in that lecture is my discussion of uh, similarity and distance metrics. But today I wanna focus on just one of those. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of them that we can use. 
uh, and that is cosine similarity. So once we have a vector and that the vectors are normalized, so the, all the X, Y, Z features are all on a zero to one scale or something, something like that, they're all normalized to the same scale. So the, so the units aren't that important anymore because the, the units have been divided out, so to speak. So now you can look at like essentially to do an inner product. So if you're familiar with a vector products, so you can do an, an inner product with two vectors. And that inner product is just, when you do the inner product with two vectors, and especially if they're all uh, normalized to have, to have a length of one, okay, so that's called, called a unit normalization. So each vector is just, you just divide by its length. So all vectors, all feature vectors of all towns or all whatever you're looking at are all length one. Okay, then, then the inner product is nothing more than the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. Okay, so the cosine similarity is very powerful because cosine of zero is one. So when, if, if the two vectors are exactly aligned, then their, their, their cosine similarity is one. If they're exactly orthogonal, which means 90 degrees apart, that is they have nothing in common, cosine of 90 degrees is zero. Okay, so, so if you just do the inner product, you don't, you're not actually calculating a cosine, you're just doing inner product, okay? Which, so which, which is x1, y1 plus x2, y2 plus x3, y3, that kind of thing. That inner product uh, from zero to one, one, they're exactly similar, zero, they're completely different. Okay, so that this measures the similarity of things. So this this is the most important concept I would say that we can apply to natural language processing in large language models, which is we do these vectors in our data set, and we can then then start measuring the similarity between different vectors. And this is a powerful thing because it turns out vectors are the, one of the most commonly used data data types in machine learning. Okay, so it could be just the data like we just did with that town. Okay, so just lists of features, for example, look at this example on image one, it's features of, the, of these different homes, okay, how many rooms, how many bedrooms, uh, things like that. So it's, it's just a list of features, or we can do deep learning, and from deep learning and deep neural networks, we, 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 we learn these compact embeddings, okay, we, we find these compact embeddings that fully describe the input, whether it's text or images or video or, or audio or whatever it is. So we have these deep embeddings of, that explain this very complex data data type, images, a document, a video, audio. And so we get a feature vector. Now the feature vector is not as clear and understandable as the, the feature vector of the, of the, of the thing we were just, the, the home or the town we were just talking about. We don't understand necessarily what the features are, uh, but nevertheless, the features help us uh, to, to disambiguate uh, things uh, in the image. So we said, these are the core things. These are the main things. Uh, that make this image different from this other image, that make a sports image different from a medical image, which is different from a business image. Okay, so there's some references here to, to how vectors are used in machine learning. These vector embeddings, again, they take all kinds of complex data sets, reduce it to, a, uh, to some kind of a feature vector and, and what they call a vector embedding. Uh, so if you're familiar with natural language processing, there's this thing called word to vec which is, does exactly this. It takes the words, the text, and produces a feature vector that describes the, the, the context and the meaning and the topic of, of, the, of the language. And that vector then can be used. You can do inner products between them. You can combine them in different ways. You know, find similar documents, find similar images, find similar audio. Okay, so in, instead of comparing every possible thing in an image or every possible scene in a movie, you can reduce it to this embedding and this vector embedding and then do ve vector cosine similarity to find some similar things or dissimilar things. But not only that, you can do, you can start doing things called, called basically search. Okay. So you can, you can build this vector database and you can start doing searches. So here's a vector that describes the thing I want. And maybe I don't know what the vector is, but I apply deep learning to my data set. So, so images, video, audio, text. And then I say, find me more like this. So I submit that that vector. Again, maybe I don't know what the features mean, but I, but I, I have the vector. I submit it to the vector database, and I can do a query by example. Said, find me similar things to this one, or or find me things that are like this, or find me things that are different from this. Find outliers. This is an incredible, powerful tool for finding outliers in high dimensional spaces. Okay, so we're familiar with outliers in single dimension. Okay, so. Okay, so if you, if you, for example, are measuring the temperature of something and the temperature gets too high or too low, uh, you can sound an alarm, okay? But that's a single, that's a single thing, one feature, a temperature. But what if you have a thousand features, okay? So you, so you, did, you did this vector embedding of an image and it's got a thousand features, okay? So if you wanna find the most, 
the greatest outlier. So maybe you're looking for some kind of security violation in your business or some kind of security incident at an airport. Okay, what is there? Find me an image that's completely different from the normal behavior of normal things in my business or in this airport or in, or in this machine shop or in my supply chain or in my business or in my products. So we had this very high dimensional vector with space. We could find the things that are very, the most different from cosine similarity just by using these vector databases and, and these uh, cosine similarities. So, so those are very simple concepts, uh, but, but they're fundamental to, to having large language models and generative AI and chat GPT work. And so one of the other things that, that really is, is at the core of all this chat GPT stuff is the conditional probabilities. Okay, so it goes all the way back probably even before Bayes' theorem, but Bayes' theorem was over 200 years ago, over you know, 260 years ago now. In fact, it was 260 years ago, uh, read the Reverend Thomas Bayes. And so it basically looks at what's the most likely thing to follow given the historical database, okay? What is the most likely outcome given the conditional probabilities here? So getting yes. close to the end here. So it, can I wrap up? Is that fine? Yes, uh, we'd really appreciate if you can next one minute, doctor. Okay, well, it's going to take a little, little, bit, little bit more than one minute, but I'll wrap up. Okay, so, so pay attention to Bayes' theorem, large language models, conditional probabilities. Uh, so my slides should give you some of the reasons you want to use this. Knowledge graphs I mentioned earlier as, as that powerful way of, of blending uh, those, those graphs about whether it's a, a business product or process or customer graph and blending that with large language models, you can get actually this, co this contextual intelligence we've been talking about and actually uh, you know, get, make the best possible decisions in your business because it's not just image understanding and language understanding. Remember, it's context understanding. And so one, some, of the, some of the great applications coming in the years ahead are virtual reality, uh, some words about that, the Internet of Things, because the Internet of Things is everywhere. I mean, so I call it the Internet of Context. So all these sensors in the world are give us contextual data. Remember, it's other data about your data. And, and it's going to be an explosive uh, business opportunity in the years ahead. And th this slide with, the, with this incredible uh, financial forecast of, of, the, of the revenue uh, growth in the Internet of Things, this was, this was prepared, this graph, these numbers were prepared before the generative AI and chat GPT revolution. And I think that's going to change everything because with chat GPT, we can now talk to our data. We can ask data questions. So these productivity concepts in generative AI, we've already mentioned several of these, you know, the graphs, base theorem, vector embeddings, uh, VR, virtual reality, metaverse, IoT. We can auto-generate alerts, reports, and notifications. So what, the, what, so what we're seeing is these emergence of categories of large language models. So, so for example, chat, LLMs. That is, you can deploy it on your local private cloud of documents and then create your own chat GPT within your own business. There's data LLMs where you can query and generate reports and stories from your data. There's task LLMs that can build AI agents and workflows to do tasks and, and perform processes in your business. So data LLM, there's actually, so it's not just a concept. There are companies like this one who is actually building these things where you can ask questions and get insights from your data. So yes, you can talk to your data, okay? Uh, so as the CEO of NVIDIA says here, you, can, you just say something to your computer. Now everyone is a programmer. And there's a chat GPT sheet sheet just for making graphics and visualizations of your data. Okay, so ask your questions to your data. So these, are, these productivity enhancements come from making sure you have your firm foundation, you don't skip over the important steps. Okay, so here's a little a meme that someone put together. Okay, trying to skip over the important steps of data quality, data literacy, and having the right infrastructure. And of course, that includes the data infrastructure to fuel the AI. So don't skip over those important steps. That's the important thing here. And remember these foundations. These are the seven topics we discovered. Uh, so my closing line is the future of generative AI is trending right now, and that future is you. Okay, so th I, I thank you. I, I know I've talked really fast here. There's a link to the slides. Uh, if I can. Uh... All right, thank you very much, Dr. So can we go ahead to appreciate Dr. Kong for that amazing work on the financial trends in generative AI? Dr. we truly appreciate your time because of our time that is fast spent. Uh, we wouldn't have much time to take questions. However, we are prompting all of the participants, doctor, to um, ask the questions and we put them together and share with you. And then um, the answers you provide, we do make it available to all of the participants. Yes, yes. Thank you. Awesome. awesome. Thank you very much for joining us, doctor. We yeah. appreciate the time. Um,
taking out that part of your busy schedule. Do have an amazing day, sir. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. All right. Okay. Um, so, for everyone on the call right now, those are not physically here, we will be taking a 10 minutes break uh, before the next session, just so that everyone, even those virtually and those here, can just stretch uh, before the next session because, with that said, it's a whole lot of information. So, before we take a break, right, please listen to the following announcements. Very important. Um, number one, we will be having uh, the we call it's the hackathon, right? It will be launching tomorrow, Mr. and Mrs. Algomini Hackathon. Right. So, we will be launching it tomorrow um, by 8 a.m. You will see it, however, by 6 p.m., you will be enabled to participate in the hackathon. Now, the hackathon is open to so only qualified participants of the AI bootcamp. There are prizes going to be won for the winners, right? So it's Mr. and Mrs. Algorithm. That means that the top mail on the leaderboard uh, by Friday when the hackathon will be closed, we will be crowned with Mr. Algorithm and we'll go home with a prize money of 100,000 there. Of course, you know that, you should know that 